In this lecture, we'll talk about what it means for a matrix to be diagonalizable, and then also prove a theorem that tells us exactly when a matrix has this property. So we define a diagonal matrix to be a matrix where the only non-zero entries are on the actual diagonal of that square matrix. So in this case, the diagonal entries are not all non-zero, but all of the entries that aren't on the diagonal have to be zero. So the idea behind diagonalizability is that for a given n by n matrix A, we would like to write A in the form P, D, P inverse for some invertible matrix P and some diagonal matrix D. Why would we want to do that? Well, finding powers of a diagonal matrix is easy. For example, here's a 2 by 2 diagonal matrix, and if we square this matrix, multiplying 5, 0, 0, 3 by itself, 5, 0, 0, 3, what we end up with is 25, 0, 0, 9. And notice that that's just 5 squared and 3 squared on the diagonal. And in fact, if we cube this matrix, we'll find that this is going to give us 5 cubed and 3 cubed on the diagonal. And in fact, if we raise this matrix to any power, we get 5 to the k and 3 to the k on that diagonal. And this allows us to compute the power of this diagonal matrix without ha having to actually do the matrix multiplication. And as you can imagine, as the matrices get larger, if we actually had to work out the matrix multiplication, that's a lot of operations that we're saving simply by realizing that the powers of a diagonal matrix is easy. One consequence of this is that powers of a diagonalizable matrix are also easy to compute. Because if we multiplied P, D, P inverse by itself several times, what ends up happening is that every time we have a P inverse next to a P, those are going to cancel out and just give us an identity matrix. So we just get p on the left, p inverse on the right, and d to the k in between. Since the d to the k is easy to compute without having to actually multiply a matrix by itself k times, all this really tells us is that to figure this out, we just need to multiply three matrices together. And when the power k is large, this is still a pretty efficient operation. Let's take a look at an example. So here's a matrix A, and now I'm telling you here that this matrix can be written in the form P, D, P inverse, where P is the matrix 1, 1, negative 1, negative 2, and D is the matrix 5, 0, 0, 3. Now, how I know that, we're going to get into, but just accept that for now. And what I'd like to do is just talk about how we figure out an expression for A to the K for any positive integer K. And the thing to realize is that A to the K is just going to be P, D to the K, P inverse, by what we talked about before. P is the matrix 1, 1, negative 1, negative 2. d to the k, as we talked about, is 5 to the k, 0, 0, 3 to the k. Now p inverse, we have to find the inverse of that 2 by 2 matrix. And though that's somewhat of a tedious process, we know how to do that, and that turns out to be 2, 1, negative 1, negative 1. So now all we have to do is multiply these three matrices together and see what the result is. It ends up looking like this. So the nice thing about this is that we now have a closed formula for this a to the k matrix, which means whatever the value of k is, we can just plug it into this formula. We don't have to know a to the k minus 1 or anything like that. If we want to know the 50th power of a, we don't have to multiply a by itself 50 times. We just have to plug in k equals 50 into this formula. So how do we know when a matrix is diagonalizable? It would be nice if every matrix was diagonalizable, but unfortunately it's not true. So it turns out that an n by n matrix A is diagonalizable if and only if that matrix has n linearly independent eigenvectors. And in fact, we can say more. A can be written in the form P, D, P inverse with D diagonal if and only if the columns of the matrix P are n linearly independent eigenvectors, and the diagonal entries of D turn out to be the eigenvalues that correspond to those eigenvectors that form the columns of P. Now note here that the diagonalization is not unique, because for each individual eigenvalue, there may be lots and lots of eigenvectors, so there might be many ways to construct the matrix P here. But another way to think about what this theorem says is that A is diagonalizable if and only if there are enough eigenvectors of A, in other words, n linearly independent eigenvectors, to form a basis for Rn. And a basis like that is called an eigenvector basis for Rn. Okay, before we launch into the proof, let's just note something that's going to be a little bit useful for us here. So if we have any n by n matrix whose columns are v1 through vn, and d is any diagonal matrix, I want to look at what AP turns out to be 
and what PD turns out to be. So when we multiply the matrix A by the matrix P, which has columns V1, V2, and so on, remember that way back when we first defined matrix multiplication, all we're doing is multiplying the matrix A individually by the columns of P. So we get AV1, AV2, and so on. Now when we multiply the matrix P by the diagonal matrix D, it turns out that what we're doing is multiplying the scalars on the diagonal of D by the columns of P. So we get lambda 1, V1, lambda 2, V2, and so on. So now compare these two results. What we see here looks like an eigenvalue eigenvector relationship, and that's exactly going to be the key idea behind the proof of the diagonalization theorem. Okay, so the diagonalization theorem is an if and only if. It says that A is diagonalizable if and only if A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. So we're going to start by assuming that A is diagonalizable. That means that there exists an invertible matrix P and a diagonal matrix D with A equaling P, D, P inverse. So using the naming that convention that we had before, we're going to let V1, V2, and so on name the columns of P, and we're going to go lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, label the entries in the diagonal of D. And by what we just saw, since we know, we're assuming in this direction, that AP equals PD, we know that AV1 equals lambda 1, V1. We know that AV2 equals lambda 2, V2, and so on. And so that shows us that V1 is an eigenvector with corresponding eigenvalue lambda 1. V2 is an eigenvector with corresponding eigenvalue lambda 2, and so on. And since P is an invertible matrix, its columns must be linearly independent vectors. That goes all the way back to the invertible matrix theorem. And so those columns of P are n linearly independent eigenvectors of A. Now notice that they aren't necessarily for n distinct eigenvalues. We don't know that the lambdas are all different. All we know is that each V is an eigenvector for the corresponding lambda. So the lambdas might repeat. We don't know that. Now going the other way, we're going to suppose that A has n linearly independent eigenvectors. We'll call those V1, V2 through Vn. And the corresponding eigenvalues we'll call lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on. So now we're going to construct the matrix P and the matrix D. We're going to let P be the matrix whose columns are the Vs, and we're going to let D be the diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are the lambdas. And now our goal is going to be to show that A equals P, D, P inverse. We know that because the VI are eigenvectors with corresponding eigenvalues lambda I, we know that for each I, A, V, I equals lambda I, V, I. And that means that each column of AP equals the corresponding column of PD, so AP equals PD. Now, why is the matrix P invertible? Well, it has columns that happen to be n linearly independent vectors, and so that means that it's an invertible matrix by the invertible matrix theorem. So we multiply both sides of this equation on the right by P inverse. The P and P inverse cancel out on the left, giving us the identity matrix. A times the identity matrix is A, so A equals PDP inverse. And that means that A is diagonalizable by the definition of diagonalizability. And that completes the proof of the diagonalization theorem. Not so bad. So the diagonalization theorem tells us when a matrix is diagonalizable, and the proof that we just went through tells us how to construct the matrices P and D that diagonalize that matrix. So in the next lecture, we're actually going to go through that process, because there's several steps involved to actually figuring out those n linearly independent eigenvectors. We'll also see some examples of matrices that are not diagonalizable, where we'll see what goes wrong in the process where we try to diagonalize a matrix.